Welcome everybody to the first Global Influencer Open Studios for getting a global live Facebook chat. Uh, Revolve Clothing, if you haven't checked it out, is just a powerhouse in fashion and apparel, uh, selling cross-border direct all around the world. Um, Kylie uh, has come with us to uh, to explain a little bit more about the inner workings of how he's done what he's done. Kai, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Josh. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, we'll have a few words about uh, Revolve. Revolve is a Los Angeles-based online fashion retailer. We carry over 800 brands and we ship to over 150 countries around the world. Um, I'm mainly responsible for international business at Revolve. Um, prior to Revolve, I spent five years in international roles at Amazon. Before joining Amazon, uh, I spent 10 years in Asia spearheading market entry and expansion for uh, established as well as uh, startups uh, companies in Asia. We have uh, 10 million monthly visits that we have over a million uh, uh, newsletter subscribers. We host uh, 10 different uh, local language sites uh, around the world. Uh, so that's a short intro about Revolve. I'll move on to the next page. So when we think about, uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of questions when we think about global expansion. One of the key questions is, you know, where can I acquire my customers? And when I think about that question, it really com com uh, contains multiple components. One is geographic region. What geographic region should you be covering? Um, as a matter of fact, there's lots of uh, free tools out there that allowing you to identify where where are the interests that are coming from in the world that interest in your brands? So what you are seeing here is a free, free tool from Google. It's called Google Trends. That what I did here, I just put in Revolve keywords in there. And Google will be able to show me all the searches around the world uh, at a per capita base uh, uh, by country. Uh, so you can see uh, at, by, you know, at per capita base, Revolve, the highest search volume we have is coming from Australia, followed by the United States and Canada. And not only you can look at uh, what country uh, people are interested in you, you can also look at as drill down to a specific cities. So you can, so you can see here, I drill down to Australia and it's very, very clearly telling me that my number one city in terms of interest from people per capita base again, is from Sydney. Uh, it's pretty much on, on the East Coast of Australia. That's where main of customers are based. So not only, uh, you can also, using the free, free tools out there, and this is not only apply to uh, Google Trends, but applying to most of tools out there, that you can also stack up comparables to you. So this particular slide is showing you how does Revolve stack up to a company called, let's say, Lehman Marcus. So you guys, as a matter of fact, I can put any companies out there. Uh, what, are, what are search trend and also in terms of volume comparison in the last 12 months, five years, however that you want it? So the, those free tools gives you a lot of information that where you should go and how do you stack up compared to your comparables. Not only you can put your own keywords in there, or your own brand names in there, you can also put your competitor's brand name in there. By having this comparison, you will be able to tell that there are certain places in the world, countries, cities, that your competitor, your, com your, your comparable is probably doing better than you, and those are probably the places that you should be uh, looking after as well. So the, the other question when we think thinking about customer acquisition, I think one of the questions that we should also ask is, in, okay, in addition to geographic area, what channels um, are our customer most active on? So what you are seeing here is an internal tool, uh, it's an in-house tool that we developed at, at Revolve. And it basically records new customer journey. It records every single session before our customer's first purchase. As you can see here, this customer on um, um, February 11th, 2016, that she, uh, she was first discovered us uh, via social media and she was using her mobile phone. Just about a day later that she came to our site uh, directly uh, through uh, on her desktop. That first of all, uh, she came to us through a uh, search engine. It's a Chinese search engine called Baidu. And then the keyword she used is Revolve. So a day ago, she just randomly uh, got in uh, through a social media post. She got onto our website. The second day, she remembered our company name and she searched for it and she, can, she came back. On the second day, she spent a couple hours all the way from 9.35 at night and all the way to the second day at 3 o'clock uh, in the morning. She came in back and forth, back and forth from different locations and came back to our site. And uh, within those couple hours that what, the, you know, she 
one of the questions I had is, why, what, why, what was the uh, key question she was looking for? What kind of information was she looking for that drove her to get up uh, in the midnight and spend so, uh, so a, a couple of hours on the site? Um, and then, as you can see later down the road, uh, by February 26, and she signed up to over email channel, um, and then she comes constantly coming back uh, through over email uh, subscriber list. And then finally, on uh, February 5th, I believe, uh, that's the day, almost a month later, uh, you know, three weeks later, she made her first purchase. So there's a couple of things very clear here, I, th I think, for the call out. One is that she engages on mobile, mobile phone and she shops on a desktop. As you can see, every time, in most cases, she came back to us through social media, uh, through email, she came back on her, on her mobile phones. And when she's trying to do some research and do a final shopping, she's on her desktop. And it took her three weeks to complete her first order on Revolve.com. And what, my question is, why does it take so long? So how does she shop? That's one of the questions I had anywhere when I go to see, uh, you know, trying, to, trying to enter a new market. So what I did here, again, I'm using search engine as a proxy to find information. So on the left hand side that you will see, I uh, basically, when you go to any search engine, you type a keyword. The search engine will, will tell you, hey, people search these keywords, also search other keywords. Here are the other keywords or search term they searched. On the left-hand side, you will see is a search term that people relate the search term to over brand name Revolve in China. On the right-hand side, what you see is the result in the US. So a lot, of, as you can see on the left-hand side, there's a lot of more information that people are looking for. They're looking for shipping, logistics. Uh, they're looking for if your products are legit, tax and duty, and so there's a lot of questions that people have in the mind when they search by Revolve. There are other things they're searching for. Though those uh, other search terms really represent their pain points. Uh, so on the right-hand side, you can see it pretty much they only search for Revolve alternative. You know, they're looking for Full Hour 21, Nastigal, Urban Outfitter, Zara. Um, so domestic, <clears throat> so it basically shows for a domestic shopper that shopping is relatively straightforward. The only thing they need to know is if it's the right price, if it's the right product, if it's the right color. Maybe they want to know if it's prime. That's about it. The shopping journey is very short. We're talking about a matter of hours, and in most, in most cases, probably a few days, that's it. As for national, there's a lot more questions they need to get answered. That's why the, the conversion funnel takes a couple of weeks to complete. So here I summarize some of the uh, barriers or challenges that cross-border shoppers are facing. Again, I'm looking at it from a consumer's perspective, but those challenges they're facing are exactly the challenge that we need to solve. Language issue, payment, logistics, and duty, right? So when we talk about national shipping, uh, if, you, if, I wanna, if, if a girl in Taiwan who's trying to buy a dress from, from Revolve, you know, she's never even received a letter from the United States, and we want her to spend 100 or $200 on us. She has a lot of questions. Uh, she, you know, a Middle Eastern customer are very familiar with Aramax. Uh, the Asians are familiar with SF Express. And one customer asked me, uh, who, what is UPS? What does universal power supply has anything to do with shipping the packages? You know, they have never heard UPS in their life. And the customer support, right? Um, I remember uh, when I was years ago, when I was working for a very large company, that they, they insisted putting a U.S. phone number uh, uh, a toll-free number as a customer support, which is showing to every single country, customers from every single country. And unfortunately, that uh, toll-free number was dialable in China. Uh, and the number will be, when you call that number, it reached to, uh, it, it goes to a 65-year-old man who lives in western side of China. And of course, one day I called a guy and tried to apologize. He went ballistic. And uh, most of my customers are <clears throat> 25 to 34-year-old uh, uh, Korea women. They shop at 11 o'clock at night. So he constantly got to wake, waken up at midnight. Last question, retailer's reputation. Who is Mr. Joe? Can I trust Mr. Joe? So here, um, I wanna, I have, I've heard a lot of questions in the past about logistics. Um, so I'm, I'm here expanding uh, a little bit on, on logistics here, showing a checkout page on Revolve. As you can see, um, there, there, there are two checkout pages. Both are shipping to Australia. Uh, the one uh, on Revolve checkout page that we pre-calculate duty and taxes, and we allow a customer to prepay duty and taxes. So the duty prepaid option will allow 
us to deliver the package goes directly to customer door without stock. Uh, it will uh, increase your customer experience that reduce your transit time. Uh, so you can see the one on the, on the top uh, is that we is, is a is a is a card that over a thousand dollars in Australia. The duty threshold is thousand Australian dollars. So we pre automatically pre calculate in taxes. On the bottom is a product. It's a price. It's a it's a card value. Uh, at $150 or 140, I can't see exactly on the screen. Uh, it's, but anyway, it's below a thousand Australian dollars. So as you can see very clearly over there, there's no duty item being, uh, being charged. But, you know, I think the point here is that uh, at a Revolve checkout page, we pre-calculate duty and taxes and we pre-collect that uh, and we pay on behalf of customer to the local customs. Over here that Revolve, we ship to over 150 countries. Um, as you can see that we work with a variety of local last mile uh, delivery companies to maximize customer experience. Uh, however, uh, with, you know, with, you know, we've, we've been in business for 15 years, but we still can only cover uh, localized 30 countries with the best in class last mile delivery companies. We still using uh, U.S. post office, uh, USPS to deliver to 140 countries. So as uh, an example I'm showing above, uh, that's to Dubai. That as you can see, that we're working with Aramex, uh, sending to Dubai. Aramex is a Middle Eastern carrier. Uh, however, the second option, uh, which is priority shipping, which is uh, using USPS. So why, you know, while we, we work with a local best in class last mile carrier, at the same time, we still work with USPS. There's two reasons for that. One is customer demands for postal shipping options. Uh, years ago, when I was doing research that, uh, in Japan, that uh, we, we used to use DHL delivered to Japan, uh, which gets there in three days. And I noticed that only 30% of customers choose DHL and 70% choose USPS. So finally, I got to talk to one of my customers in Japan and asked a question. And then she said, you know, most of my customers in Japan, uh, are, they are Korean women, so they work during the day. And in, in Japan, it's a complete disgrace to deliver your personal package to work. So they, or the package are all delivered to, to home address. Um, so when DHL uh, delivery people come to her house, knock on the door, she's not home. The first day, they leave a note. Second and third try, and then she will get a note saying, hey, you know, we tried it three times. Uh, please pick up. And she said, you know, the, the, the Japan Post does the same thing. However, the, the post office is a block away from me. Um, the DHL uh, depot is about cross town, you know, takes for me an hour to get there. That's why I choose the uh, postal service. So, so there's a lot of, you know, even though you, 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 well, you probably want to offer multiple different service that USPS uh, has always been uh, one of the, uh, the default choice that we, we offer. And the second is that the postal system provides you maximum coverage that anywhere in the world that you want to, that post office will be able to cover. Next page, please. Sure. Hey, Kai, I don't know if you can hear me, but, um, my understanding is also that USPS, because they have agreements with other government entities and other government logistics, it, it can sometimes be a little bit smoother of a process and certainly um, uh, on a price point, much more competitive. Is that accurate? Yes, that's accurate. Uh, that's, just, uh, that's especially accurate for emerging markets. And for emerging mm -hmm. market, that a postal clearance is a lot easier than the commercial clearance. Okay. Thanks. Cool. Uh, thank you. Next page. So in summary, uh, I'm putting a, a, a short summary for uh, what we just discussed, global customer acquisition. Uh, you know, in, in terms of ge geographic coverage, there's tons of free tools out there uh, that you can pro prioritize the region, city, or the language you want to target based on your uh, current interest coming from abroad. Uh, there are tons of free tools out there. Uh, the ones I showed you are Google, uh, are Google Trends. There's, of course, also uh, Amazon's uh, alexar.com. Uh, there's, a, there's a tool called Google Market Finder uh, where you can, the URL is showing on the screen, which you can input, uh, you, know, you, you can select your industry, uh, the product you sell, the price point, and it will show you the countries that would be interested in your product in terms of logistic readiness, the growth of your particular segment, and all that. And it will provide you a list of countries that you should be targeting. And of course, there's also uh, Google Analytics, which is something that you own the data, that you should be able to clearly see where your customer is currently coming from, uh, and also where that visitor is coming from in the world. Uh, if you don't have currently, don't have glo uh, a significant global footprint, so you don't have your own data, uh, look up your competitors or comparables to see where you could expand to. Channels, uh, we talked about channels. You, should, you want to prior 
prioritize channels that your customers are most active on. You know, for example, the one example I showed you earlier was from China, and very clearly, 50% touch points that coming from China, Chinese customer, they were through social media. Uh, so those are, you know, which, which is a strong hint that's a channel you cannot give up. Last, when we think about customer acquisition, let's don't forget customer experience. That's probably the first thing that we should think about that we should understand and solve those challenges they're facing. That by having a better customer experience, your conversion rate will drastically improve. We're not talking about 10 or 20% improvement. We're talking about doubling easily uh, of your conversion rate. I think one of one of point I really want to communicate through every time I talk to people about cross-border marketing or cross-border um, expansion or market entry is I try to understand your customer uh, segment may change from country to country. So, well, you know, years ago when I when, when I started a new job, on my desk there was a piece of paper describing uh, my my initial uh, assignment. Uh, and, and this new job, my my first uh, task was try to take the company to China. And uh, on the bottom, on a particular page, it has a description of my target customer in China. It basically uh, describes a, a luxury role model uh, with with income over one hundred fifty thousand dollars in China. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see that's one of the charts showing, uh, it's a McKinsey study, was showing the customer segmentation in China. It's, it's a couple of years old, but I think it's still valid today to discuss. Um, as you can see, the electric role model at the time only represented 1% of household, but however, represent 19 to 24% of the consumption. Uh, this group of people, they tend to buy spontaneously. They value service, particularly good, good service is very important to them and they reward good service with return visits. And that is the luxury role model segment of our exact customer base we have in the US. Um, that we are very, very proud of our service level in the United States. We deliver in three, two to three days that we provide 100% free return, no question asked. Um, there's other two other segments that I was looking at. One is middle class aspirants. So we're looking at oh, close to half of the household population that only accounts for 10 or 16 percent of the purchase. And then the third one that I was looking at is called fashion clinics. So those are a group of people who spend disproportionate amount of money uh, of their income on fashion product. They exert a strong influence uh, over people, uh, uh, over within their circle. They're very active on social media. Um, they're particularly looking for products that, because they are, they're, 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 they, they, they're very active on social media, they want to show off what they purchase, they tend to show off products that have difficulty to find locally. Um, so my, at the time that uh, when I was thinking about going to China, uh, by default, of course, the, com the company believed that all the customer in the United States, all the customer in China should be the same exact customer in China as well. My argument at the time is that when you move to a new country, that your, your target segment will shift. And let me give you one example. For the luxury role models that they value service, which is something we provide in the United States. However, if I go to a place like China, that my package will take over a week to get to my customer's hands. Just imagine if a Chinese customer sits in Shanghai there's a piece of dress that's available next door at the same time, also available on the website. What is her choice? Is she going to buy from us waiting for a week or she's going to walk downstairs, go to next door, try it on, nose fit, and enjoy right away. Opposed to a week later, she got a package and a dress size was too small. No, that's obviously that she will be buying from the next store. And also, it's when you're looking at all the local competitors, uh, say in Korea, Samsung Fashion will be, be able to deliver the same day in Seoul, and Iconic in Australia will be able to do next day delivery within Australia. My core competency, my core value proposition in the United States, which is service that does not exist in another country. However, when we turn table around and we're thinking about a Chinese consumer, if there's a piece of dress or product she cannot find locally, that is the product. She's going to get out of bed at 2 o'clock in the morning, come to my website, and make a purchase. My value proposition in China is accessibility. It's not a service. So when entering into a new market, your targeted customer segment may change. Uh, you need to redefine your core value proposition. You will lose a few. At the same time, you're going to gain a couple. You want to identify the most correlated customer segment to 
your uh, value proposition. And it's after that, that by knowing that you're understanding your core value proposition, redefining your customer segmentation, you want to adjust your marketing mix to adapt. You know, for, for example, I gave earlier the Chinese consumer, um, the fashion fanatics. They're very, very social driven. Naturally, social will be a big playground for you to market your consumers. Um, most importantly, of course, don't forget that we want always constantly want to improve of customer experience. And Kai, would it be safe to say that you use, you go through different channels, obviously, in different regions? Can you talk a little bit about that? You are absolutely right. I think that's uh, something you probably missed in the presentation. Uh, in generally speaking, uh, the, the channels when I look at around the world uh, by different regions, um, my major channels are very different. Generally speaking, of course, this is going to be uh, different from retailer to retailer. Generally speaking, uh, Western, uh, Western countries, Australia, uh, Canada, Europe, there are more heavy um, performance marketing. When you go to Asia, Middle East, Latin America, that social media are very, very dominant and also very effective, powerful uh, channels. So, um, in terms of customer acquisition, uh, early on we talked about uh, for, we gave an example of a new customer journey. Uh, we talked about for a international customer, the conversion funnel, the conversion period is very, very long, it's ultra long. We look at three weeks, the example we showed was three weeks. In the United States domestic market, that conversion funnel is only a matter of days. So because there's a, a longer conversion period as a marketer, that we should be aware that there's, we need to build more touch points into the conversion funnel. So um, since the, the more touch points also means more investment. So efficiency requirements calls for more focus on building free channels. So you need more channels, uh, you need more touch points, and you need more free touch points. So uh, we really need to emphasize on retargeting, on social. Those are very, very good channel in terms of keeping the customers in the conversion funnel for a long duration period of time until final conversion. We're talking about global partners, so where should, where, where should you market, right? We talk about social, we talk about performance. You know, I think the, the answer here is no surprise. That Google and Facebook, they are your global partners. That, uh, the reason I think they're global partners, there's a couple of reasons. First of all, one-stop shop. They offer a full range of products from prospecting to remarketing or retargeting all the way from they offer a variety of different advertisements from tax ads to display all the way to video. They also offer a single interface uh, account management and with a global coverage. Um, I put that into number uh, for a well established online retailers like us that uh, those two probably accounts for mass majority of the marketing spend. Uh, I would say if I want to throw a number up there, I would say 70% plus of the spend will be spending on, on those two partners. And I think there's one thing I do want to point out is about a ROAS. The, the ROAS on Google and Facebook are different. Uh, Facebook requires login. So they have almost 100% clarity in terms of tracking, cross, particularly for cross-device tracking. Uh, so in, as a direct result, uh, on a true same ROAS, uh, uh, return on investment basis, uh, normally you will see Facebook's, uh, the ROAS showing on Facebook is uh, two to three times higher on Google. So uh, in order to do an Apple to Apple comparison, you have to do some adjustment uh, there. That's one thing that uh, I think is a huge pitfall that uh, when, when I talk to marketers out there, uh, that's been missed, I want to point out here. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, my secret sauce is extremely simple. It's really tell your own story. It's uh, message your own value proposition in the right channel. Uh, you know, some of those we, we discussed earlier. Um, some of the fundamentals, if I really think about in terms of performance marketing and as well as social marketing fundamentals, and I kind of want to uh, take out three, I, I want to kind of list out three fundamentals that I see. For performance marketing, regional bidding is extremely important. So what does it mean? So regional bidding, if you think about today, we're in, when you, when we're in the U.S., it is winter. So uh, a lot of bidding strategies are based on return on investment or, or ROAS. Um, it's, it's in the winter, so winter coats are naturally selling better, so your ROAS is high. If you don't have regional bidding, what's going to happen is that you're going to bid up your winter clothes all over the world. When you think about Australia today, right now it's in the summer. Uh, so you, you are probably bidding up a Canada goose in Australia, which completely doesn't make sense to them. So you want to have the ability to really be able to bid, optimize your bidding by region, preferably even by country. Second one is to try, choose the right attribution model to calculate your ROAS. Question. Okay. Sorry. 
what is regional bidding? Can you just go back? What is bidding in general for people who aren't using these tools? Okay. So uh, bidding, a very simple example is that for a particular keywords on Google that uh, I want to bid X amount of dollars, say 50 cents or 80 cents. Uh, that's my bid. Um, so you normally those bids are calculated by, by, by certain algorithms, the tools that you use. Uh, a regional bidding is that basically saying, I want to bid this on 20, bid, bid, let's say, let's say keyword Canada goose ja jacket. I want to bid, bid in the U.S. for 80 cents, uh, and I only want to bid uh, 5 cents in Australia, because Australia is in the summer and the uh, United States in winter. And the reason I decided to do that is because today in, in the U.S., more people buy Canada goose. Uh, as in Australia, there's less people buying uh, or interested in Canada goose. Uh, choose the right attribution model uh, to calculate ROAS. The example I showed you, uh, the customer journey, as you can see very clearly that there are 50% of, of the touch points uh, through her first purchase were through social. However, her last touch points was coming directly to her website. So if we use a last touch uh, attribution model, all the uh, return on investment will be assigned to last touch point. And all the effort you did on on email, on your social media, would be uh, accounted for nothing. Uh, so you want to use a multi-touch point attribution model. So the social media will get the right share of the contribution for that particular purchase acquisition. The next one is uh, build out uh, negative keywords on performance marketing. Uh, this is you know mainly for search engine, uh, Google, Yandex in Russia, J uh, Baidu in China, Naver in, in Japan. Is that um, when we think about international, uh, that one challenge we're really facing is low keyword volume, a uh, low volume per keywords. Um, now those are volume are so low, it is very they, they don't they don't even have a statistic in, uh, significance, and it's really difficult for us to predict what is the right amount of dollars amount should be assigned, what the bidding I should be assigned for those particular keywords. So what you want to do is that you want to have your keyword to be a little bit wider, but once your keywords get what wider your ROAS drop, your return on investment drop dramatically. Um, so the, the way to deal with that is really try to build up your key, uh, your negative keywords. You know, for example, for Revolve, 90% of a business are women. If I'm thinking about a keyword, let's say uh, common project shoes, I probably want to block out all the keywords that relate to men's product and try to focus all those on women's product. Uh, so by having negative keywords, allow you have to have a wider keyword target at the same time, have a decent ROAS. So, so just to repeat, Kai, so negative keyword words are essentially saying, we do not want these keywords entered into our targeting. And those are things that if you know that you're definitely not this market segment, you don't put those in versus the opposite. And I presume that's essentially it. That is correct. You know, the, given the, go, go back to, to the example I gave, common project shoes. Now that would have been anything that has um, common project shoes in there. It could be common projects, men's size 40. Um, so anything that has men's related keywords in there will be blocked. Social marketing, uh, there's another question that uh, it's three fundamentals I want to bring up here. They're very simple, straightforward. Um, one is repeat. That repeated campaigns, programs, activities that, it, that drives participation. Why do you want participation? Because once you have participation, you have engagement. Once you have engagements, your followers, followers will be able to see the post. And then effectively, you're expanding your reach, uh, your marketing reach to more people. So if you're thinking about, you, know, you have every single follower you have, have another 10 followers. And if you have 1 million followers, by marketing specifically to your followers, followers, you're marketing toward 10 million, uh, you know, 10 million pe people versus 1 million people. The next one is uh, mixed branding and performance activity to maximize your return. Uh, Josh, do you have a question? Yes. Just quickly, is this is this stuff differ at all for overseas um, in some way versus domestic? I think this applies to uh, domestic and international uh, in general. That um, I, I see a lot of marketers uh, those mistakes people make. They do um, they do a random post. No, you should do. Uh, you know, a series of posts with similar attitude or, or similar kind of uh, program. For example, if you have a good night post to, to your audience, you should every day do a good night post. Not just say, hey, I, I think this post is really cute, I'm gonna to post today. 
No, you want to make that a repeatable program and a repeatable activity. Rituals. Okay. Yep. The last one is that uh, uh, mixed branding and performance activity to maximize return. Now, I, just a few days ago, I was looking at um, uh, reviewing a, a very premium brand's uh, social activity um, in, in, in China. The, the China. In China, there's a, there's a platform called Weibo. And I was looking, this, we're talking about a you know, world probably top 10 most luxurious brands. And I noticed that uh, they are very active posting. They post probably 20 posts a week. However, on every single post, there's no link whatsoever. Uh, why does putting a link on a post important? Because when you put on a link, that when people click on it, that once they got to a site, all the other performance activity will kick in. You know, for example, you're retargeting, and then they may have a possibility to sign up for a newsletter, your email campaigns, everything that will be kicking in. That by having all those channels working together, instead of having channels working in silo, your conversion will increase dramatically. But unfortunately, most companies I've seen that branding and performance marketing, they are two different completely separate teams and there's a huge wall between them. And that's when you really, when you go to global, that is really something you want to break. You want your branding team and your performance team working together. So uh, here's a, I want to give a case study um, because the, the marketing topic is, is huge. Um, so I try to, first of all, I try to focus on a few fundamentals and here I want to give example. I think because you know fundamentals are a little bit vague. And here I give a specific example. So Revolve took a California-based beauty brand to China. It's called Lime Prime. Uh, that we took a phased approach to market Lime Prime in China. Uh, that uh, we, you know, the, the phased approach basically we started with accumulating followers uh, and to make it fun. And then uh, we, you know, we specifically try to target followers, followers, and then uh, eventually the last phase. So the phase one. Uh, what we did here is prior to launch Lime Crime in China, Lime Crime had a limited awareness in China that their social presence, presence in China was spread across different social accounts uh, on different social platforms. There's, uh, you know, just like multiple different platforms has little pockets of their followers or, or, uh, or their fans. So in the phase one, uh, over goal was very simple, it was primarily try to centralize Lime Crime's existing social presence under a single account, so it can be uh, so it can be accessed through a single unified marketing campaign. Uh, the tactics were extremely simple. So we basically went on different social platforms, so searched for posts that has mention of Lime Crime, that we contact the most influential accounts in China, that they uh, and then basically you know we're talking about organic accounts. Those are people who are core Lime Crime brand lovers. And we announced the news that Lime Crime is officially come to China with Revolve. And we asked them to follow Revolve account to stay tuned. And also, you know, try, they, we asked them to spread the news uh, on their uh, individual account uh, while at Revolve. Um, then we encouraged Lime Crime lovers to vote for their favorite products. And those uh, data were collected and used in over buying decisions. Um, eventually, and during that process, that they were also able to introduce Lime Crime, Crime products to Revolve fans, which are roughly about 300, 400,000 followers strong. Um, so phase two is that where Lime Crime sponsored 20 bloggers uh, with gift box containing most popular items as well as new products uh, that's, uh, that's gonna arrive soon. Um, then we engaged each uh, 20 bloggers and then uh, had, his, had his repeated activities with them the goal here is really try to get over uh, audience to participate in those engagement. And then uh, at the end of phase two, uh, we, we had a, we contract, we worked with a, a local Chinese beauty blogger, which is a, a beauty a mega influencer. Her name's Naomi. Then Naomi hosted a one hour live stream of uh, on Revolve uh, social account to introduce Lime Crime product. Uh, that live stream had over 1 million viewers. And today, I think at the time I wrote this, uh, this presentation, that we had uh, 8,000 comments today, I believe probably over 10,000 now. Um, and also that existing uh, followers uh, brought their friends to watch live stream uh, post. Uh, every single post we had, uh, there's a link on it uh, that will be able to bring the audience to Revolve website, which will be later on used for retargeting purpose. And then here's the page, uh, phase three, it's basically product launch. Uh, the official product launch uh, on site, you know, was official statement was will be launched at 8 p.m. that day. 
that including an official email sent out, the site banner talking about Lime Prime product launch overnight. However, the product was activated at 6 p.m. Um, so there's, there's, the reason that it's a two hour difference is very simple, is that we announced, will give us the ability to, to announce the, a secret early access to Lime Prime product through social channel. So why do we select, uh, why do we do this, right? To give a two hour early access, there's two purposes for that. One is, you know, 6 p.m., the timing is very important. Six o'clock, everybody's sitting in, in the subway, sitting in a taxi, they got nothing else to do. And at the same time, we're giving them something they felt is extremely secretive. And it's, when, you, when it's secretive, it's great to share. So they're sitting in the taxi, they got nothing else to do, and they have a secret in their hand, so they massively share the news that Lime Crime is coming to site earlier, and I'm the one knowing about it. At the same time that we actually working on the connector. So on the right hand side, you will see this is a tool that we have that allowing us to see the spread of all the post. So when people forward a post, that become a new dot. And then when uh, we'll be able to see how those posts are, are, are traveled uh, around in, in the social space. And in the past that we have been constantly using this data. So we know where are the major influencers that will be able to help us to make this post or this news explode. And then we deliberately reach out to those people that are giving them the access to even before six o'clock, that letting them to spread news, to making this post viral going on the internet. And of course, you know, performance marketing will be kicking in uh, at, at eight, eight o'clock that are retargeting people who came in and was interested in Lime Crime product. So that's a, that's a, a simple case study uh, of social media marketing uh, in, in, in China. I think that's all of my presentation. I think uh, we're going to Q&A session. Yes, we're gonna go into Q&A, Kai. We wanna thank you very much for, for sharing all this insider knowledge and secret sauce, as you called it. Um, one of them actually relates to a conversation I had with Heather Burke at your company, um, where she was uh, talking about increased return rates and customer service, and how do you deal with customer service? How do you deal with customer service globally? How do you deal with increased return rates? Is that a good thing or not? Um, and and how do you facilitate a better engagement overseas when it's obviously going to take longer, et cetera? Yeah, I think that's a philosophy that we have. Uh, first of all, Revolve, we're a very customer-centric company. Uh, for us, uh, I've heard a lot of complaints, including very large uh, traditional retailers. Uh, they've been asking us, how do you reduce return rate? Uh, the way we look at it, return rate, return is just a way, uh, it's just a cost of business. Um, a healthy return rate is really good for the business. That we don't discourage customers to return product. And we strongly believe a healthy return rate that actually dramatically help of business. That's, that's the primary reason that evolved in last year. We launched free return in Hong Kong and Australia, and we have seen extraordinary results. And in 2018 this year, we would like to expand our free return service program to Canada uh, as well, to, uh, to Europe as well. As for customer service, uh, again, we're a very customer-centric company that we try to provide customer service to, uh, to customer as easy to them as possible. That's why we are having uh, worldwide uh, toll-free numbers. We deploy them in Asia, Europe, um, Canada, Australia, that for us, for customer to, to be able to call in uh, to ask a question, make it easier for the customer. Okay, another one, uh, when I was talking to Anna Tran from your company, somebody else mentioned this on their chats. You've talked about the Revolve girl, uh, and I say girl because that's predominantly, as you said, 90% of your market. Uh, to what degree does that girl change, or better yet, to what degree does your branding and your assets change in a, to a, for a given market versus being centralized from, from headquarters? We're still a very lean company, um, and for Revolve, a product, a company like us, we sell very fashionable products um, in a lot of ways that we're a company exporting American culture. Um, so if we combine the fact that, you know, we re we, what we really do is we're exporting the U.S. culture at the same time, uh, organizationally, we're very lean. So the branding assets actually are the same across the world. Uh, with also our assets, the image, they are probably are centralized being controlled, but the delivery mechanism, the channels they've been delivered are different, are very drastically different from, from country to country. You know, for example, in the US, we primarily deliver through uh, Instagram. But if you go to Middle East, 
that Facebook is very, very prominent. In Taiwan, Facebook is, is, is huge. So a lot of content will be, delivered, will be delivered in different social media platforms. In China, of course, Facebook's blocked. So we, we will be delivering through Weibo or WeChat. The, con the, um, the content, the, 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 mess the aspirational message are the same, but the way you deliver them are different by region. And then what do you do in the case of Australia when you're selling winter coats in, in the U.S. and they're selling, you know, you're selling bathing suits? How do you deal with that? That's a very good question. Um, so for uh, when there is a climate difference, uh, that different product will be featured uh, as well. So, Kai, when you do look at new markets, I mean, what are some of the most exciting markets that you see out there? My immediate interest are Western Europe and Asia. Those are the area already very big for us. And we see the tremendous opportunity for us to increase our revenue there. Uh, at the same time, for uh, longer term, you know, for for longer terms, Latin America as well as Middle East are the ones that will be the future growth. What is it about uh, the Middle East, for example, that you see as a potential um, blocker, let's say, or one of the most challenging areas of going into the Middle East? I would say language, uh, payment, uh, those are some of the key issues that we're facing. Uh, we are starting working on uh, logistics already. As a, uh, early on, we, we showed example, we're already start working with Aramax to deliver in the country. We're improving on logistics front, but payments uh, as well uh, as language, those are the key issues that we're facing. I see okay. a question from Patty. Uh, how do you address regulatory requirement for shipping a cosmetics to China market? Uh, there's a definitely, yes, the, the, the re regulatory requirement is very, very high if the product is actually uh, shipped within China. However, if it's cross, shipped across border, uh, your, the regulatory requirement or burden will be, can be dramatically reduced. I, you know, thanks, Kylie. If, there's any, if there are any other questions, feel free to post them um, again below, uh, and you can comment throughout through all eternity, and we will be monitoring it, and we will make sure that uh, we find you. Uh, and we respond to you. Um, and, and again, if you want to find out when we go live, uh, you can do that. Just type in Get Global in the comments below, and we will uh, notify you, or you can just follow us on Facebook. Um, Kylie, again, thanks a lot. Josh, thank you very much. Have a wonderful